I'm going to ask Robin, our webmaster and merger person and past president, to introduce our speaker. In 2006, the LWVUS adopted the position on supporting the abolition of the death penalty. The position was adopted by concurrence with the uh, position that was adopted by the LWV of Illinois. So in November, Californians have an opportunity to speak out on this uh, issue via Proposition 34. And our speaker today, Michelle Welsh, will um, provide us with information on why Proposition 34, which is called the Savings, Accountability, and Full Enforcement California Act, um, <clears throat> and why we should support it. Uh, Michelle has been providing, or has been practicing law since 1978. She received an undergraduate degree from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and a law degree from Monterey College of Law. So some of her awards include the Courageous Advocacy Award from the ACLU and the Chief Justice Phil Gibson Award from the Monterey County Bar Association. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Welch. Thank you, everybody. A lot of you in this room, of course, know me as Mickey. So you feel free to call me that. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. And I want to tell you, people always say what an honor it is to be asked to speak. I'm telling you, I mean it. To be asked to speak about a proposition on the ballot to this organization is kind of daunting. You people actually read the materials. <laughs> Not only that, you think and you're thoughtful about how you vote and how people should vote and the public policy that your vote represents in our state. And that's one of the reasons uh, why I wondered, with the League of Women Voters already endorsing Proposition 34, yes on 34, in fact signing the ballot argument, the California president signed the ballot argument, why am I here? The answer to that is pretty simple. I'm here because Proposition 34 is important. In light of the League's long-standing, since 2006, policy opposing the death penalty, this is our first opportunity in California to actually do something about that. The other thing is that this year, with Proposition 34, it's an immediate opportunity to really do something about our state budget. And in a minute, I will tell you why. So people always have and probably always will be either in favor of or opposed to the death penalty itself. But if that isn't what sways people the most, look at the cost. And so these factors are all coming into play here in Proposition 34. And that's why I'm here. The latest poll shows that this proposition is not on people's radar, that this is not something people are thinking about or talking about. So that's the other reason I wanted to talk to you about it, so you can talk to people about it yourself. The latest poll shows 42% likely voters will vote yes on Proposition 34. 45 likely voters, 45% are likely at this point to vote no, and 13% are undecided. So as often happens, these undecided voters are the ones that are going to make or break the election on this issue. I'm also here because as a lawyer who represents school teachers through their union, the California Teachers Association, I have seen the devastating effects of our state budget cuts in education. I don't want to see that again. In the past five years, I have represented over 300 teachers who are being laid off in Monterey, San Benito, and South Santa Cruz counties. This is inexcusable. So if this alone is the reason why people would consider voting yes on Proposition 34, I'll take it. So what is Proposition 34 and what does it do? It's called the Savings Accountability and Full Enforcement Act of California, the SAFE Act. 
So in a nutshell, it changes the death penalty in California, the maximum punishment for a crime in California, if it passes, would be life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now think about that. That means life in prison without the possibility of parole. These people will not ever get out of prison. It also allocates some of the savings from reallocating the death sentences to life in prison without possibility of parole to pay for law enforcement to solve the unsolved rapes and murders that are rampant in California. 46% of murders in California are unsolved. 56% of rapes. This is inexcusable in a minute. When I get into the cost a little, a little more detail, I'll tell you about Monterey County, which is worse. This is inexcusable. This means that we are keeping behind bars already people who have committed horrible crimes. There's no doubt about it. And they should be behind bars if they're not capable of functioning in society. That's where they belong. But we're spending tremendous amounts of money to keep them there when they're already behind bars while perpetrators of equally heinous crimes are still among us because there's no money to prosecute them or investigate the case. That is poor public policy. So Proposition 34 would cause savings. It would cause accountability. And it would cause full enforcement. What's the accountability part? The accountability part is that right now, inmates on death row are treated very specially. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. But they aren't even allowed to work. So they never pay into the Victims Restitution Fund. They get more exercise, more visits. They get a private room. Ordinary inmates don't get any of these, and they do have to work and pay in to the Victims Restitution Fund. If Prop 34 passes, so will these death row inmates. They will have to work and pay restitution like every other inmate. Full enforcement, as I said, is to allocate sufficient funds to law enforcement to make us all safe. And that's one of the reasons that the acronym is the SAFE Act. Probably most important to some people is that if Proposition 34 passes and people are kept behind bars for life instead of executing them under the death penalty, we will know in California for sure that we will never execute an innocent person. There have been 140 people exonerated from death rows in the United States in the past few years, thanks to the Innocence Project and DNA evidence and other ways to show innocence. The risk of executing an innocent person is not acceptable. And with Prop 34, we will know that that will never happen again. So why now? Why is Prop 34 on the ballot now? This is because California has the largest death row in the nation. 725 people are on death row. 20 of them are women. The rest are men housed at San Quentin. When former San Quentin warden Jeannie Woodford, who herself oversaw four executions at San Quentin, when she started there in 1978, there were six the growth of sentences of death meted out by courts increased that dramatically. That was caused by several factors that we probably don't need to go into here, but the law changed to force judges to issue the death penalty, to sentence people to death if they committed certain crimes. That was in effect until it was held unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. Nevertheless, there's a growing list of what's called special circumstances, which warrant a death sentence in California now. And the judges and juries and everyone associated with a death penalty case spend not only significant amounts of time and money, but also the emotional expense to our society is great. According to the legislative analyst, 900 people have received death sentences since 
the death penalty was reenacted in 1978. For those of you with a longer memory, our death penalty in California was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, followed immediately by an initiative to reinstate it, which passed by a margin of, of 68%. Fourteen of those 900 have actually been executed. Seventy-five have had their sentences reduced by judges. They had successful appeals, one sort of another. Eighty-three died in prison. With our own budget in crisis, and schools, police, firefighters, and other government services being underfunded, it's now time to take a close look at this dysfunctional death penalty system that we have. It's not working. Senator Webb said something I want to repeat to you because I think it's important. Speaking of the United States, we incarcerate four times more than any other country. Either we are the most evil people in the world, or we're doing something wrong. Now, I refuse to believe that we are evil people. So what we're doing is something wrong, and it's time to fix it. Let me talk about the cost for a minute. The cost of the death penalty, according to the legislative analyst in California, is $130 million a year in unnecessary funding. That's what the legislative analyst says will be saved if Proposition 34 passes. This is a conservative estimate. It's hard to know the actual cost of every level. But there was a study done by Ninth Circuit uh, Justice Arthur Alcaron and a professor from Loyola University called Paula Mitchell. And you can look this up and read the whole study if you like. I know how careful you all are. This showed that California would save a billion dollars in five years if the death penalty were changed to life without the possibility of parole. When the district attorney seeks a death penalty, and ours in Monterey County has done that and continues to seek the death penalty when he thinks it's appropriate, some counties don't. The cost to the local courts goes up. The cost of the district attorney and most often, the cost of providing defense counsel for the accused, because there has to be two, and there has to be lots of investigation that adds to the cost. The cost increase estimated by 20 times over the cost of prosecuting a non-death penalty case, even if the penalty is life without the possibility of parole. Special care is taken in the investigation. Two attorneys are assigned on each side. Two trials must occur. The trial and the liability portion to find out whether the person should be convicted, whether they actually committed the crime. Then a separate trial on the death penalty. What is the appropriate penalty? According to, again, former warden Gene Woodford, the typical amount of time between arrest and sentencing in Los Angeles County is 800 days. So there are significant delays in order to achieve the justice that really is required if our society is going to, to issue a death warrant for somebody. After committing a crime, they better be as certain as possible. So these protections are needed. After conviction, housing death row inmates costs $100,000 more each year than housing ordinary inmates. $50,000 is the cost of housing an inmate in our prisons. That's something to think about in itself. It's $150,000 to incarcerate an inmate on death row. Why is that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, they have a single room, a single cell, so they're not sharing like everybody else. They have extra security. Every time they leave the cell, there's a security guard with them, and they're in handcuffs. And they have to leave the cell. They get exercise. They get visitation with their friends or relatives. In fact, they get more than ordinary inmates get. Besides that, they need staff to handle a huge file that they are entitled to review. 
boxes and boxes of court documents and evidence are there at the prison for them to look at. And according to the former warden who did this four times at least while she was there, Jean Woodward, they had to send staff to retrieve a box every time the inmate asked for it. And then they had to take that box and put it back. And then they had to get it again. And it happened over and over and over for each of these inmates who were sentenced to death. Now, why do we have to do this, spend all this extra staff time? Because we as a society and they deserve to prepare for their appeals. They need it. They need to be able to do that to meet with their attorneys. And the reason why is because they are entitled to an automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. The interesting thing about that is that the attorneys who handle these appeals, most of whom are appointed and paid at public expense, have to be experts, and they are not, there are not that many of them. So that causes further delay. By the time they can get assigned to the case and actually prepare briefs and prepare to argue the case for these death row inmates. So those appeals for death penalty inmates comprise 30% of the California Supreme Court's caseload. This means that other cases, civil cases in particular, and other important criminal cases have to be taking a back seat so that the court can hear each and every one of these cases. That is contrasted with a criminal defendant who's convicted and not sentenced to death. Even one sentenced to life without the possibility of parole gets one appeal at public expense. And in that appeal, the court must review the evidence, but once the court reviews that evidence on that one appeal, and it's at the Court of Appeal, not the Supreme Court, that appellate process comes to an end unless the Supreme Court grants a hearing. And in that case, the inmate would have to provide their own lawyer. So you can see right away the difference in costs of the appellate process. Now why is that? Because when somebody is incarcerated after convicting a crime, a court of appeal takes a look at it and says, we're affirming, yes, this was correct, then in likelihood it was. But if somebody is going to get the death penalty and be put to death, we need to be more certain, even more certain, and justice requires it. So we need those appeals. But the total cost is $184 million a year for all these processes. The trial investigation is $40 million, $72 million for the housing costs, the special extra housing costs, $58 million for state appeals, and $14 million for federal appeals. So you can see that as far as public policy goes, the amount of resources dedicated right now to the death penalty is completely out of line with the resources that are dedicated to just about everything else. So that causes us to ask ourselves, what are our priorities? We have people who are already in jail. They're not going anywhere. If their sentences are converted to life without the possibility of parole, that means without the possibility of parole. No one is even going to look at them until the end of their life. They will die in prison. And yet we're spending all this money on them instead of other law enforcement, or other types of things like, one dear to my heart, education. So the funds under Proposition 34 would be reallocated. $100 million of the savings would be allocated to the Safe California Fund. And that would be used for local law enforcement. So our law enforcement here, the sheriff and police departments, should get some of that to solve the unsolved rapes, and murders. The unsolved homicides in California, as I mentioned, are 46 percent statewide. In Monterey County, guess what? Anybody have an idea what our percent of unsolved homicides is here in Monterey County? 63 percent. That doesn't make me feel safe. Unsolved rapes in California, statewide are 56 percent. 
in Monterey County? Guess again. 65%. And that doesn't make me feel safe either. If Proposition 34 passes, a significant amount of money will be allocated to our local law enforcement. I know, I have heard, I don't know for a fact because I haven't been there, that there are rape kits, you know, the evidence they collect when there is a, a rape that occurs at the sheriff's office that there is no money to move forward and test them all. So there's delays there. And as anybody in law enforcement will probably tell you, if there's delays in trying to enforce the law when a crime happens, the likelihood of ever enforcing it diminishes. Proposition 34 will di divert funds instead to solving crimes instead of paying triple for those who are already behind bars. Justice is served by Proposition 34 because those people who are convicted of these heinous crimes will remain incarcerated, they'll work and pay into the compensation fund, and the people of California will get a fair share of the state budget. So what does the opposition say? Are you all convinced yet? <laughs> oh, good. Well, what is the opposition saying? Because you really should read that too, and you should understand what they're saying. They're saying the death penalty is a deterrent to crime. How many believe that? <laughs> well, as it turns out, studies have been done. Homicide rates in states, and there are 17 states now without the death penalty, homicide rates are not higher. And in most of those states, they are significantly lower than ours in California. And during the period of moratorium, where the courts are hearing the lethal injection cases, the, the way we put people to death, not whether we do, while there's a moratorium on the death penalty, the murder rates have not gone up either. So either criminals are not following the court and saying, oh, gee, this, I better uh, murder somebody today because the court might decide tomorrow that this injection is, is working. No, they're not doing that. In fact, it doesn't appear that they're paying any attention. No study has ever shown a connection between having a death penalty and any deterrence to crime, and particularly murder. What does deter crime? Law enforcement. Effective, prompt, immediate enforcement of the laws. The opposition also says, don't amend it, don't end it. Mend it, don't end it. In other words, let's keep the death penalty, but make it, make it so it works better and doesn't cost this much. Opponents advocate adopt a single drug rather than the three drug combination. In other words, the way that people are put to death can be legislated. That is probably not true because the inmate, the person convicted, has a right to raise the issues, whatever they are, about the manner of, of death and whether it's cruel and unusual. Some states have a single drug legislation, but in some states these issues have not been raised as they are here. They say, require more lawyers to take these appeals. <laughs> Do they mean pro bono? Yeah. <laughs> in order to hire more lawyers to expedite the appeals, costs would drastically increase, not decrease, every year. So that is really not a viable option with our state budget in the state it's in right now. What else do they advocate? They advocate streamlining the appeals so that there is only one. There's no way actually you can constitutionally do that. Even if there is, and there is now, one automatic appeal to the California Supreme Court, everyone under the United States Constitution has the right to bring what's called a habeas corpus petition. It means have the body. Did you know that? If you're incarcerated, you can bring a petition to have your body back. That's what a habeas corpus is. And you bring that in federal court. You have a constitutional right to do that if you're being held unjustly, if you're being held against the law. So there's no way that legislation in California can prevent somebody from, uh, from their right to habeas corpus. As we found out 
by the Supreme Court ruling on the detention cases. If you remember, the, the uh, terrorist cases were saying, you know, let's not have a habeas corpus right for these people. And the Supreme Court said, no, that is a right that they have. So it's a right everybody has in California. The fact is, regardless of what you do to try to fix the death penalty, it is dysfunctional and it's not working. It's poor public policy. Justice Carlos Moreno, retired from the California Supreme Court, called it broken beyond repair. The current Supreme Court Chief Justice, Tani Cantil Sikwe, said that it is dysfunctional. And when you have people at that level of the judicial system telling us, as the electorate in California, that our death penalty system is broken and dysfunctional, we should listen. I have another quote here from Brian Stevenson, longtime a death penalty opponent. The question is not whether they deserve to die. The question is whether we deserve to kill them. That is the question, whether we as a society deserve to devote all these resources, to incur the emotional cost as well as the financial cost of putting people to death for crimes. The effects of the death penalty reach all of us. Most prominently, they reach everybody in the judicial system who's involved with a death penalty case. According to Jean Woodford, the former San Quentin warden, the effects on her staff were excruciating. The people that actually had to deal with the prisoners and take them to the death chamber and those who had to administer death. She said the most frequently asked question as she goes around speaking about this now, she's speaking wherever she can get an audience in favor of yes on 34. People always say, how can a warden who put four people to death under the death penalty be opposed to the death penalty and she says, how could a warden who has put people to death not be opposed to the death penalty? So she's one of a nationwide group of former wardens who are actively working to convert the death penalty to life without possibility of parole. They're not necessarily wanting to abolish. They don't use that word. They want to convert it to a different sense, life without the possibility of parole. So it affects us all, the judges, the judges who need to hear these cases are sometimes tortured when they have to issue a death sentence. If a jury in that second phase of trial decides that death is the sentence, the judge now has no choice. And various judges have written about this. There's a recent article uh, featuring now deceased, retired Justice Stanley Mosk, who was on the Supreme Court throughout the changes in the death penalty always himself was an opponent of the death penalty, but as a justice on the Supreme Court had to uphold it, he would write concurring opinions saying, I have to uphold the death penalty, it's the law, but this is wrong. Every chance he got, he spoke about it. And now, every chance they get, our current Supreme Court justice and a still living retired Supreme Court justice are still speaking about it, and the light hasn't dawned yet but it's about to. So, I urge you to talk about Proposition 34 to people so it gets on their thinking list. It's something that they will have in mind when they go to the polls. And remember to say yes on 34, because as usual, people don't know whether what they want requires a yes vote or a no vote. How many of you have experienced that? I know I have. Even when you get in there, you're ready to vote and you think, uh-oh, was it a yes or was it a no? And you actually have to go back and read something. So make sure that if you're talking to people and if you do feel strongly that this is not good public policy and that this is not the way we should be spending our money in California, then say yes on 34. I will leave you with one last thing. Then I want to hear your questions. I know how much you all love to play Stump the Lawyer, so here I am. <laughs> 
You can endorse. There are materials that I brought that are over on that table and one sheet where you can sign to endorse and your name will appear on the website for Yes on 34, Safe California. You can also campaign, take some of the literature and pass it around to people you know who vote. There are phone banks that you can participate in and I can tell you how to do that or you can email the campaign. You can talk to voters. You can also write letters to the editor and I have sample letters. If anybody is interested in doing that, I'll give them to you and you can use those. So there are things we can do in California to address this dysfunctional system and I hope you will join me in doing those. Yes on 34. Thank you. Who wants it? Before I ask my question, repeat those statistics that you gave in the very beginning about the polls. I was shocked because I hadn't heard those before. You mean who's in favor and how many are in favor and how many are against at the moment? Okay, this was last week and it was 42 yes, 42% yes. It was 45% no and it was 13% undecided. Okay. Where is the big money coming from that, that is opposing this? Uh, do you know the sources or is it like Citizens United? We don't know where the money is coming from. And my other thing is how do we tie gun control to any of this? Well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> Probably initiatives have to deal with one issue at a time, or at least they're supposed to. The opponents of Proposition 34, the proponents of the death penalty, are police organizations, sheriff's organizations, district attorneys' as associations, and some legislators. So you can look on the website and see who has endorsed the no on 34. And you can also see the endorsements on the yes on 34 website which include all sorts of organizations, crime victims organizations, and many crime victims. There are also crime victims listed on the no side as well, and a lot of descriptions of terrible crimes, because that should sway you to want, you know, vengeance against these people, I guess. But the money, there isn't that much money, to tell you the truth, on either side. Where's George? George was the one who followed the money. So I don't know if you have a better answer to that question, but I do think it's the, it's the associations, of law enforcement associations that have put up money for the no campaign, and I haven't heard much from the no side. And on the yes side, it's various organizations plus a couple of generous donors who care about the issues. And they're named on the website as well. Gun control, obviously, you've hit right to one of the causes of the rampant crime that we have that leads ultimately and tragically to the death penalty. And as far as gun control goes, that would be a topic of a different conversation. So would corporate personhood. <laughs> <laughs> Where your, your esteemed president wrote a wonderful article on that too. Invite me back, we'll have a talk about it. The thing that is so hard for me to understand the, I can understand the law enforcement people who actually deal with the criminals could have a real emotional feeling of, about vengeance. But the California district attorney's budget would be greatly increased by this. Yeah. Their attorneys, they should know that the death penalty is not a deterrent. How can they possibly be so against it? It just doesn't make sense. Do you have any insight? I have some. First, not all district attorneys are opposing Proposition 34. Gil Garcetti, who is the past district attorney from Los Angeles County, is a proponent of yes on 34. And that is probably for many of the reasons you just cited. Our own district attorney here, Dean Flippo, believes, and I think it's sincere, that the law and order kinds of laws that have been enacted and, and in effect all these years, for the last 30 years, have worked. That crime is down, crime is down all over the country, a bit. You wouldn't know it from the amount of crime there is, but it is down, the rates. But I think many district attorneys 
are on the same page as law enforcement in thinking that these punishments for crime are the appropriate public policy that we should have in California, and that that is what works, and that, frankly, uh, they do believe that victims deserve to have this kind of punishment. I've heard that said by several people. According to Gene Woodford, though, who met with the victims at the time of execution, she said, and I believe her, there is no closure for them. Executing the perpetrator of a crime a decade later or more provides absolutely no closure. So those are reasons. I wouldn't agree with those reasons, but they are reasons. But it's true, their budgets could be used to enforce the law against these other unsolved crimes. I think the courts would still be busy. I wouldn't worry. By the way, when they abolished the death penalty in Illinois, I knew some lawyers there who were death penalty lawyers, the team of lawyers who handle the appeals. I have never seen people happier to be out of a job. Nikki, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering why you think the crime rate in Monterey County is so high, or unsolved murders and rates. Does it have anything to do with the gang situation? I don't know that for a fact. I would imagine that it does because as alleged and as appears in the papers all the time, a lot of the murders that we have here in Monterey County uh, do turn out to be gang related. And we do have prisons here in Monterey County that are participating in a lot of the gang activity from even inside the prison. So I think that probably contributes to Monterey County. Our beautiful coastal community really does have quite a bit of crime and the appalling statistics on the unsolved crime. One of the, broch the handouts that I have over there is a chart. I should have done a PowerPoint. You could all see it, but go pick one up that shows the different counties and the rate of unsolved rapes and murders in those counties. And Monterey is high among them. Monterey is in the red mm -hmm. on both. Is the change of sentencing, um, will it be retroactively changed for the 770 people on death row currently, or is it only going forward? That's a good question. The question is, is it going forward, or will the change to life without possibility of parole be retroactive? It will be retroactive. And that's one of the reasons there'll be some costs. There won't be a full $130 million savings in the first year, or possibly two, because all those resentenced death row inmates may have issues that they need to raise in the courts. So there might be some court proceedings for those inmates whose sentences will automatically be converted from death to life without the possibility of parole. Well, the biggest shock to me is the percentage of people that want to maintain the death penalty then I realized I often can't understand how anybody could vote the way I, you know, vote differently for me, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I'm in the league. <laughs> but so given those 13% uh, undecided and so forth, because I think this is maybe, I don't know what, what it is, but I, I think that people have pretty well decided a lot of things because there's so many things to decide on. they got to start somewhere. And if they know about the, this being on the ballot, which has been more public than the other things in the ballot, they may have decided already. So what can we personally do about this uh, to, make, to try to tell people what we think about this? this uh, I mean, it's a little hard to bring it up, isn't it? It is. It is, except that the fact that people are now voting, between now and Election Day, people are, are going to be voting. So. It's good to broach the subject of how people are voting and start a discussion about it. The things that you can do, you can write today, you can endorse. You can sign that and I will add your name. I'll send it in and add your name to the, to the list of endorsers on the website. You can hand out some of the literature to your friends or neighbors. You can participate in the phone banks. They set up phone banks on Sunday from 4 to 7 and Thursday from 6 to 9. And I can give you the information about how to do that. Uh, or you can just check out the website, the Safe California or Yes on 34 website and sign up. You can do them from your home. I'm hoping to set up a couple of phone banks live in my office or somewhere where people can get together since some people prefer to do that as well. And just talk to people. Talk to everybody. Uh, there are some church, many churches, I should mention that, 
The Catholic Diocese has come out in favor of Proposition 34. Our Catholic Diocese and our Episcopal Diocese, as well as statewide, have come out publicly. The bishops have come out urging people to vote yes on Proposition 34, and many, many churches are doing that still. So if you do belong to a church, this is a perfect opportunity to raise the issue of the death penalty. I want to thank you all very much. And I want to thank Michelle for coming. Mickey, we really appreciate it. Before you go, I just wanted to tell you, to, to su suggest one more thing you can do, which I have found extremely well received. The League of Women Voters recommendations on the ballot measures, I put in an email and I send to every person in my email list who lives in California, no matter if they're not political friends, if they're people you've never discussed politics with, I have never had anyone tell me it was unwelcome. I have many people who I've never had a political discussion with thank me for the information. So I urge all of you to put that information, the League's recommendations, which are found on the website, stick them in an email, send them out widely, and do it this week because the mail-in ballots are going to be received any day now. I urge you to do that. Spread the word on what the League believes. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the League has an ad in the weekly about this exact same thing, what the League recommends for the ballots, and we got an extra week's publicity because it was in last week's weekly and it's supposed to be in next week, so for the same money we're in for two times their error. <laughs> Thank you, Mickey, for being here. <laughs>